So uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you for being with us today, uh, uh, at this evening for the CPR CSH Urban work Monthly Workshop. Uh, we've uh, already in 2022 covered a range of subjects, and today we're turning into the urban politics scenario with a talk uh, from Mumbai, uh, based on Mumbai, uh, uh, by Tanu Kumar, uh, who is a postdoctoral researcher at William & Mary Global Research Institute. That's right. And uh, Tanu is actually soon going to join the Claremont Graduate University as assistant professor and uh, has been working on issues of housing and urban politics and in, in, in the context of Mumbai. And uh, we've engaged in the past with some of her work on public housing projects in Mumbai. And that's a, that's a common area of interest between uh, what CPR does and what Tanu of how uh, she... uh, I won't uh, make a further introduction everyone has got got the email and we know what what Tan is going to talk about today and really interested in hearing about how demands shape government response it's 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 a subject that uh, has a much wider I think app application in the up uh, in urban theory and urban governance so over to you Tanu and uh, welcome once again uh, for the audience uh, please feel free to use the chat window the Q&A box whatever you feel comfortable with raise hands we uh, I think we'll have time to get you to ask your questions uh, you know uh, allow you to ask your questions yourself etc so we'll try and keep it as interactive as possible as is possible in this webinar format over to you Tanu. and thank you once again for getting up at 6 a.m to to speak with us thank you so much uh, for the introduction and thanks for having me here i know it's kind of a strange time as well for cpr it's a little bit on the later side so thank you everyone who's here um, let me just share my screen One second. Every you can see. Yes. Okay. Yeah, we can see. Okay. Um, yeah. Hello, everyone. Um, as Mukta mentioned, I'm a postdoc at William and Mary, and um, thank you again for having me here. Um, I'm really excited for a chance to present some new work, which is, um, you know, on how what the content of demands, what they're actually about, shapes government responsiveness. And this is a paper that brings together both theory and evidence based on Mumbai. So this is a picture of an open manhole in Mumbai. I'm sure all of you know this, but open manholes are really big problems in Mumbai and um, many other cities during the monsoon. When the roads flood, if someone falls into one of these, it's basically a death sentence. So if I'm a citizen, what do I do if I see one of these? Uh, it would be great if there was somebody I could call or some clear way for me to access the corporation and ask somebody to do something about this immediately. And there are many offices and phone numbers I can call online, but so it often feels like the likelihood of somebody actually listening to me is low. And here we see a different kind of problem. This map is of a section of Bangalore based on a study that I did there with some co-authors a few years ago. And so each of these uh, little shaded blocks, it's a neighborhood, right? And it's, this is the neighborhood, um, there are, all of these neighborhoods are served by the BWSSB. And we surveyed a sample from each of these neighborhoods to learn about how frequently people receive water. And what you see is, sure, some neighborhoods receive water every day, but others receive water every six days or more. So there's a lot of inequality in service provision in the slice of Bangalore, and this type of inequality isn't unusual in cities in India. So both of those, the open manholes, inequality in um, service provision, they're just examples of different types of problems with service delivery that citizens can face in, citizen, in cities in India. And so one way for citizens to actually do something about these problems is to complain through e-governance systems. And we've actually seen a huge amount of investment in this type of platform across India in the last few years. And 
the thought is, you know, if there is an issue with public services, one might log on to an online platform, submit a complaint, and possibly get a response. Of course, citizens often work through their networks to make demands heard, but these platforms are actually more formal spaces and it allows citizens without any personal connections to come in and complain as well. Zooming out a bit, we know that where resources are really scarce, politicians tend to allocate them to different groups of citizens. And so in that paper on with the, where the map of the water supply is from, for example, we show that allocation of the water supply can be strategic. And so the strategy often requires communication between politicians and voters through brokers or other types of intermediaries. But the process of working through informal intermediaries can be a result of citizens' existing political connections. And this means that people who are already well-connected are going to be more likely to be able to make complaints. And so you can see why this would act, might actually deepen inequities in service delivery. So the thought is that formal institutions like e-governance systems or grievance redressal portals can basically create a level playing field for disadvantaged citizens. Anybody will be able to lodge a complaint. There will be an official and formal process for that complaint to make it through the system. But of course, a prerequisite to the success of any type of system is that citizens actually get a response. So the question that I'm asking today is, when do formal mechanisms for complaint making and when do e-governance platforms actually yield a response from government officials? And this isn't a new question. There is sort of a broader literature on government responsiveness. And I would say this is actually more of a literature on government accountability. And it operates through a principal agent framework, which asks two questions. Under what conditions are politicians accountable to voters? And under what conditions are bureaucrats accountable to voters and politicians? And these are two different strands of research. And the research on politicians identifies variables like degrees of decentralization, rates of political competition, election timing, and rates of non-electoral political, political participation and, you know, um, as important avenues for accountability and predictors of responsiveness. The main mechanisms you know, constraining bureaucrats' behavior, on the other hand, is hiring and remuneration policies, oversight by politicians, and oversight by citizens. What these two areas of research have in common, generally, though, is that their explanations for responsiveness, they typically apply across all types of demands and issues. And so in this paper, I ask a slightly different question. So, I ask, why might we see variation in responsiveness even within a single sector? And so this figure, for example, it shows that officials within Mumbai's water sector respond at different rates to digitally placed complaints about different types of problems like leaks, shortages, and um, contamination. And so you can see that leaks, they get by far the highest rates of responses, but issues related to shortages or unauthorized use, you know, like water tapping, um, they're barely addressed. So what accounts for variation in responsiveness to, for, um, to these demands within a sector, but, and also why does this variation matter? So, I explain this variation by creating sort of a stylized distinction between what I call reallocating and non-reallocating demands. A reallocating demand, I say, argues defined by its resolution. Um, examples would be complaints about insufficient hours of, like, of electricity. Um, and so this type of complaint requires redistributing resources such as hours of service from other citizens to the complainant. Oh, I see something in the Q&A, one second. Uh, yes, I will elaborate on how the data was collected um, in, in the future um, as I talk more about the paper. But just to zoom back out a bit, a reallocating demand, it's defined by its resolution. So, you know, it requires redistrib redistributing resources from other citizens to the complainant. Um, 
I argue that re resolving this type of demand, um, actually, it might actually generate backlash by other citizens in the short term. And this backlash, it might entail more complaints from another area or citizens complaining to politicians about bureaucrats. Addressing non-reallocating demands, like complaints about a downed power line or a leak in the pipe system, it just, it requires some amount of state capacity to address, but it doesn't necessarily require the redistribution of resources already allocated to another citizen. And so I expect that non-reallocating demands, they're more likely to be addressed than reallocating demands. So this seems pretty obvious. Um, so why should we care about this distinction between these two types of demands and what does this categorization actually teach us, um, especially what does it teach us about the potential for these systems of allocation to generate equity in service delivery? And so I argue that the incidence of complaint type will vary with characteristics of where complainants live. So people will make different types of complaints depending on where they live, and these patterns will vary with existing levels of service delivery. Where services are good, citizens, citizens are less likely to demand reallocation, but where they're bad, they're more likely to demand reallocation. And I also expect responsiveness to generate more complaint making in the long term because citizens will make complaints when and where they believe they'll get a response. And so zooming out a bit, the reason the distinction between reallocating and non-reallocating demands really sheds light on um, it really matters is because it sheds light basically on two distinct equilibria that I argue can mark an enduring divergence in sort of community levels of complaint making and service provision. And I'll discuss this more in a few minutes. So in this pres presentation, I'll elaborate on the theory and then I'll show you an empirical illustration in Mumbai's water sector. Um, as everyone knows in this audience, Mumbai's water sector is one in which where both pipe leaks and shortages are endemic. And in the sector, I categorize complaints about leaks as non-reallocating demands and those about shortages as reallocating demands. And most of our knowledge about how complaints are made in Mumbai's water sector here concerns political, ne political networks. But citizens here in Mumbai, they can also lodge formal complaints with the city online through an app or on the phone. And this is just all of these complaints, they go through the grievance redressal portal. And I'll talk about this data collection process a little bit more in a few minutes. But what I did was I collected the universe of complaints lodged from 2016 to 2018 through the website used for tracking these complaints. And I developed a data set of about 21,000 unique complaints about water during this time. And then, so I, I also use supervised machine learning techniques um, to classify the text of complaints and responses. And using this data, I present three sets of empirical results that I think support my theory. First, officials respond to complaints about leaks at higher rates than they respond to complaints about shortages. Pretty straightforward, not that surprising. Um, second, complaint making. As I argue, it's also correlated with existing levels of ser service delivery. As the ward level mean hours of daily water supply increases, the number of complaints about leaks increases while the number of complaints about shortages decreases. And then third, I use a, a difference, in difference, difference in differences design um, in the context of a water supply cut across part of the city in March, 2017. And what I find is that the cut increases the incidence of complaints about shortages, but only where past responsiveness to complaints has been relatively high. And so, what I think that the data suggests overall is that areas with different levels of service provision will make different types of complaints, which in turn vary in their likelihood of getting a response. And this variation is further an important predictor of subsequent claim making, um, complaint making. So before we get to the data and empirics, I just wanna zoom out a little bit, talk about the theory and place it in the, um, in the context of the broader literature on complaint making and responsiveness. Um, as many of you know, um, there was 
this wave of decentralization that occurred um, in India at the end of the 20th century. And part of this wave was the rise of, you know, formal non-electoral institutions for citizens to complain with public, to communicate with public officials. And these institutions, they often have a transparency mechanism built in as well, you know, to prevent officials from exercising discretion and who they respond to. And so we see a mixture of high tech and low tech options. But the main point is that these are institutions that allow citizens to approach officials with their complaints about public services directly. And grievance redressal systems are common at the central state and municipal levels in India. And I consider a very specific subset of institutions, right? Um, I'm not really talking about deliberative institutions such as um, panchayat meetings where citizens decide amongst themselves about how re resources should be allocated. But I'm thinking about institutions where somebody with power responds to citizen input. I'm also thinking about institutions where this person responding is somebody who's, is somebody who's a non-elected official, basically a bureaucrat. So how do we think about how officials prioritize um, demands? We know um, from work about the way um, that, we know from previous work um, from political science that the way officials prioritize demands, it might look different across service sectors. Um, so I might have my way of prioritizing demands in the water sector might look very different than in sanitation or electricity. Um, and this is just because responsibilities, resources, and processes look really different when you're looking at sanitation as opposed to, say, healthcare. And so, for that reason, I assume we're looking at one sector only. But even within a sector, demands can take different types. And I think of addressing each type of demand, um, say, in bus services, you can think of demands about more routes or fixing buses as distinct as a separate type of task. And so we know when bureaucrats have multiple tasks, they're going to focus on the ones that they're most incentivized to complete. And so obviously they're going to prioritize. And so this implies that each task incurs trade-offs. So my resources, including time to address all these different types of demands are fixed. And so handling officials are going to prioritize the demands that are the lowest relative cost to complete. So, what does this prioritization look like? And I'm arguing that the handling bureaucrats will make a distinction between reallocating and non-reallocating demand. When addressing a reallocating demand, like the demand for more electricity or more water, um, one thing that I can do as a handler is direct water for, or electricity from one citizen to another. Um, this is because you know, if the supply of water or electricity is fixed, Increasing the service hours for one citizen requires decreasing the service hours um, for another set of citizens. So in healthcare, for example, a doctor sent to one hospital must come from another one unless, you know, we have some excess supply of doctors available. On the other hand, responding to non-reallocating demands, it, it doesn't really require the appropriation of resources already allocated to other citizens. So think, for example, about demands to fix downed electricity lines or burst water pipes. Addressing these demands, it definitely requires some amount of resources or capacity, but it doesn't require resources already in use by another citizen. And this distinction between reallocating and non-reallocating demands, it will be context specific. So think, for example, about a complaint about broken bus infrastructure. Um, whether we call this a reallocating or non-reallocating demand depends on how the problem is addressed. If we just want to fix a handrail, handrail this will probably be a non-reallocating demand. And unless we take a handrail from another bus to address the problem, um, this will be non-reallocating. But if the bus needs to be replaced entirely, then the response might be reallocating, especially if the overall number of buses in a system is fixed. So this distinction is going to be context specific and depends on the required response and the short term binding constraint in a system of service delivery. And this distinction between reallocating and non-reallocating demands, it's relevant to the handling bureaucrats for two reasons. 
Of course, um, in any system, the handler might not even have the authority to respond to a reallocating complaint. So in that case, it's just not actionable. But even when the handler or the bureaucrat does have the authority to reallocate resources, doing so might lead to backlash from citizens. Um, a recent paper, for example, suggests that variation in the ability of citizens to complain about to complain to politicians about bureaucrats is a mechanism for citizen oversight, and that might affect bureaucratic responsiveness to citizen complaints. We might also see backlash in the form of complaints from other citizens, which will just increase a bureaucrat's workload in the short term. So these complaints, these reallocating complaints, they can be really costly in terms of time. And I'm not saying that for non-reallocating demands that local capacity isn't important, right? Both types of complaints require some level of local capacity to resolve, like material resources, time, personnel, and expertise. But because reallocating demands are even more costly to address, I expect them to get lower levels of responsiveness. And so the point is that we have to think about what the binding constraint on service delivery is. And almost always the binding constraint in a water supply system, for example, will be how much water there is in the system, not whether or not there is um, material to patch a pipe. The government will eventually run out of material to patch pipes, but it will definitely run out of water first. And so, as I mentioned a little bit earlier in the introduction, I think this distinction between the two types of demands, it's important for two reasons. The types of demands that citizens make, it's going to be correlated with underlying levels of service provision. So, for example, an area with infrequent bus service, it's likely to make complaints for more frequent service, which might require decreased service on another route. Um, on the other hand, um, a place that already receives a lot of buses a day is more likely to make complaints about bus repair or driver behavior. And so more broadly, an area with already high levels of service delivery, it's more likely to make non-reallocating demands, but an area where service delivery is poor is more likely to make reallocating demands. And then I also think this variation in responsiveness will have implications for future complaint making. We know from a lot of existing research that citizens are more likely to participate in civic life if they expect their actions to have some meaningful impact on governance. And so I argue that high levels of responsiveness are more likely to be correlated with even more complaint making in the future. So one of the main implications of this theory that I spent a really long time talking about at this point is that complaint making and responsiveness, they can really exist in a self-fulfilling equilibrium that looks different based on the existing levels of service provision as we see here. So the types of complaints that citizens make will vary with existing levels of service provision. Responsiveness will in turn also vary with the types of complaints being made. And this responsiveness, it shapes citizens' expectations about getting a response and also their future complaint making. And so what we see is that these formal institutions for um, lodging complaints can really generate a virtuous cycle of complaint making and responsiveness, but only where levels of service provision are already high. And so we see sort of the existence of high and low level equilibria based on existing levels of service provision. Let me just see, there is a question in the chat. Oh, okay. And so I illustrate this theory in Mumbai's water sector. Um, I don't need to tell this audience this, but like most cities in India, Mumbai always faces a pretty constant water shortage. There's technically enough water from nearby lakes and dams to provide its citizens with adequate daily supply, but a lot of this is lost through leaks and pipe bursts between the source and point of supply. Water supply, it's also unequal. Um, it's rationed out to different areas in rotation for several hours at a time. This is very common, but um, the average hours of supply a day is about six, but this really varies with the socio-demographic characteristics of different neighborhoods. So in 2019, the MCGM or the BMC, they found that non-slum areas received more than three times the daily volume of water as slum areas. And 
Um, this is really important. As all of you know, more than half of India's Mumbai's population reportedly lives in slums. So citizens complain about water a lot, right? They complain about leaks, shortages, unauthorized tapping of water, pipe bursts, and really anything else related to water. And there's a lot of work out there suggesting that complaints about water form a central component of political life in the city. People approach a broad range of intermediaries, including engineers, informal fixers, and social workers to access water. And citizens can also approach officials with their complaints directly through a formal process. They can lodge a complaint with the BMC through its online portal, which you see here. They can also access this web website um, through their phones um, or through an app. And once I make a complaint, I'm given a number um, which I can use to track the progress of complaint, the progress of the complaint to make um, this process a little bit more transparent. And you know, if we look at data from these portals, complaints about water are really frequent. The organization Prajaf, based in Mumbai and also present in Delhi, has tracked um, the frequency of complaints for um, since 2010. And water supply has been in the top five complaint categories um, every year. So once a complaint is made uh, through one of these portals, it's sent to a handler in the ward level hydraulic engineering department. And I talked to some of these handlers to learn about the process for addressing these complaints. And it really differs by type. And we can see this through the addressal of leaks and shortages. Um, so when a complaint about a shortage comes in, um, the handler first determines whether the neighborhood of origin of this complaint is really operating at the, at the supply schedule. If so, um, the complainant often told that no resolution or action is possible. If for some reason the water schedule is not being followed, the water, um, the water supply schedule, it can be reshuffled a little bit, right, to provide one area with an extra hour or so of supply. And so the engineer contacts the valve man or the individuals responsible for pressuring different sections of the pipe and asks them to turn on um, different sections of the supply system on or off sooner rather than later. Another solution is to send a tanker or um, to an area with low water supply. Um, more often than not, if an area is receiving less water than usual for some known reason, um, that reason, which is often the water in the reservoir is low, is given in the response to the complainant. And so if multiple complaints are arising from a neighborhood for an unknown reason, um, an engineer will be sent there to learn if there are problems with the infrastructure. Um, but you know, really large infrastructural causes of water shortages like water main burst or pipe burst, they're more likely to be submitted under different categories of complaints. Um, so in most cases, there's actually no real solution to a complaint about a shortage of, other than diverting water from one area of supply to another. Um, more often than, than not, there's really not very much you can do to address a shortage problem. When a complaint about a leak comes in, on the other hand, this is much more straightforward. Somebody is sent to investigate the source of the leak. If one is found, that leak is patched or the relevant section of the pipe is replaced. And this is an action that really doesn't affect service delivery for other citizens beyond the area being served by the faulty pipe. Of course, in some sometimes um, they might have to depressurize sections of the pipe system to replace that leak, but it's not, we're not really taking water from one set of citizens and diverting it to another. So these descriptions, they suggest that the resolution about complaints about leaks and shortages follows two distinct patterns, right? Resolving a complaint about leaks, it doesn't really worsen service delivery for others outside the relevant valve area. A complaint about shortages, on the other hand, is a request basically for more supply hours. And so the main resolution of this shortage, which I've really beaten you over the head with this, is to allocate more supply hours to, the, um, to certain areas. And so it, for this reason, I defy complaints, define complaints about leaks as non-reallocating demands and those about shortages as reallocating demands. <clears throat> 
So I learned more about patterns of responsiveness um, and I sort of support my theory by collecting data on all of the complaints and the text of the responses. So if you remember the website I just showed you, I scraped the whole thing to learn about all the complaints lodged from 2016 to 2018. Um, so I can talk more about how I did the scraping in the Q&A if anyone's interested. Um, and this process, it generated information about 21,000 complaints in the water supply complaint type. And so each complaint ticket includes the original complaint text in Hindi, Marathi, or English. And so I used, um, I translated all of these into English, and then I used sort of basic text analysis and supervised machine learning processes to classify these complaints into different topic categories. And this graph shows the overall incidence of complaints of each type over time. And you can see that complaints about leaks and shortages are by far the most prevalent, suggesting that they're really important categories to study. Each complaint also contains information on its official status, which is closed, registered in process, or reassigned. And you know, what we can see is that the majority of complaints are actually marked as closed, and we can't really see any clear patterns over time by complaint type. But even when the official status of a complaint is closed, there's reason to believe that some of these complaints actually don't get a response because we can look at the text written by the handling officer to get an idea of what happened. So for example, many complaints receive false complaint as a response and several complaints about water shortages receive water in the reservoir is low as a response. And so what I did was I used the text of the responses to classify um, these responses basically as action taken, false complaint, incorrect or missing information, referred to the other department or no action taken for some other reason. And so I'm happy to talk about this classification process in the Q&A for anyone who's interested. But what you can see now is that when the text of responsiveness is classified to see whether any meaningful action is taken, um, we can see a clear pattern, right? We can see that leaks get a much higher rate of response than complaints about shortages. And this is the same figure that I showed you at the beginning of the presentation. So just to note, um, complaints that are marked as action taken are usually marked as closed, but the reverse isn't true. Just about 47% of complaints marked as closed are actually classified as action taken. So I first show simple patterns of responsiveness to different types of complaints within the water sector over time. Um, the main outcome is the percentage of complaints registered on a given day that I classify as action taken. The main predictor of interest uh, measures the number of complaints that a ward receives on a given day. So in other words, um, I'm just estimating how a ward office changes its levels of responsiveness as its caseload increases. And so I see a divergence in responsiveness by complaint type. Across all water-related complaints, there's a negative, re negative relationship between the number of complaints that's registered on a single day and the rate of action taken. Um, this isn't very surprising, right? As offices get more complaints, um, they'll respond to a smaller percentage of them. But this relationship, I think, is driven by complaints about shortages, right? So for every additional complaint about shortages registered on a given day, the rate at which these complaints receive a meaningful response decreases by about 1%. Um, but there's no measurable relationship between the number of complaints about leaks that comes in on a day and the rate of resolution. And so what this is telling us is that there are binding constraints on the resolution of shortages, but these constraints haven't yet kicked in as the sample um, haven't yet kicked in for the sample for the resolution of leaks. Next, I show that the incidence of different types of complaints varies with existing levels of water supply provision. Um, so what I do is I test whether the ward level daily complaint rate varies with fixed um, ward level service provision. Um, so here um, I use the mean daily hours of water supply as the indicator of service provision levels, um, because I think supply hours just best approximates the total 
volume of water households receives from the public utility. So um, my main outcome of interest, again, is the, is the number of complaints registered on a given day divided by the total number of individuals living in the ward. And the main predictor of interest is the measure of the mean daily hours of water supply. Um, and I'm not arguing here that um, an increase in mean supply hours causes more or less complaints. Um, it's likely that there's an omitted variable here, like socioeconomic characteristics or real problems with service delivery that drive the relationship. All I'm trying to do is show that different types of complaints tend to come from different types of places and that levels of service provision are an important differentiating factor. And so very simply, the results can be seen here. There's really no measurable relationship between the ward level daily complaint rate per capita for all water related um, complaints and the mean daily supply hours. So this suggests that areas with different levels of service delivery, they're not likely to exhibit variation in complaint making in general. But this null relationship, it really masks um, two correlations that are going in opposite directions, right? Boards that experience one more hour of service generate more complaints about leaks per person and fewer complaints about sh shortages per person per day. So what I'm seeing is a divergence in the types of complaints that are made as levels of service provision increase. Finally, um, I argue that citizens complaint making, it's really shaped by past levels of responsiveness. It's not really informative here to show just a correlation between past responsiveness and present levels of complaint making. And this is because, you know, I've sh sort of showed that rates of responsiveness and complaint making are correlated. So any relationship between past responsiveness and subsequent complaint making, it could just be the result of, you know, co correlation of complaint making with, with, with an award over time. So instead what I do is I look at how a differentially experienced shock to the water supply affects complaint making and how this effect varies with previous responsiveness. So basically from March 25th to April 8th, 2017, about half of the wards in B the BMC experienced a 10% reduction in the supply hours as a new valve was installed, installed in the Pandup water supply tunnel. And what I basically did was a difference in difference design for two sets of wards, those with low levels of responses, responsiveness prior to March 2017, and those with a high level of responsiveness prior to the March 2017 supply cut. In both sets of wards, there are wards that are affected, the dotted lines, and those that are unaffected by the supply cut. Um, and by high responsiveness here, I mean wards that have a higher than the, than the median level of responsiveness um, for the six months prior to the water cut. And so what this graph is doing is it's showing that the daily, it's showing the daily number of complaints for each of these types of wards. The shaded gray area is the 15 day supply cut. And so what we can see is that in the run up to the supply cut, there's really no difference in complaint making trends between affected and unaffected wards for wards. Um, but then during the supply cut, we see that um, for wards with low levels of prior responsiveness, there's really no effective complaint making of any type um, for the wards affected by the supply cut. For the wards with high levels of responsiveness, however, um, on the left, we see that effective, affected wards generate more complaints, particularly more complaints about shortages during the supply cut period. Um, the table on the left just shows some coefficient estimates. You really wanna focus on the interaction effect that's highlighted by the red box. Um, most simply, the shortage adds about 0.47 shortage related complaints per day, um, almost twice the daily rate of complaint making across the three years. Too. And the point is that this effect is only visible in wards that have been relatively responsive to complaints over the past six months. And then the table on the right shows that these complaints are driven by prior responsiveness to complaints about leaks rather than complaints about shortages. So I separately estimate effects for wards that are highly responsive to complaints about shortages at the top and leaks at the bottom. I'm sorry, the table title sort of mixes this up, so this is a little confusing, but um, 
I find really no measurable effect of the water shortage in boards that are relatively responsive to complaints about shortages, but I find that it generates about 0.3 more leak related and 0.3 more shortage related complaints per day in boards that have been highly responsive to complaints about leaks. And so these are these results, they're just showing that the difference in differences effects that I showed in the table on the right, um, sorry, on the table on the left are really driven by wards that are relatively responsive to complaints about leaks. So why don't we see an effect on complaint making in wards where responsiveness um, to complaints about shortages is relatively high? Oh, there's a question in the chat. Oh. Anu, we can take the questions at the end. So just, okay. just finish okay. answering. So, I was asking, why don't we see an effect on complaint making in boards um, where past responsiveness to complaints about shortages is relatively high, right? Theoretically, the mechanism here that responsiveness is sending signals to citizens about either um, its capacity or willingness to respond, it should apply regardless of the topic of complaints to which governments are responsive. But it's possible that even in places um, where responsiveness to complaints um, about shortages is high in relative levels, it's still low in absolute levels. Um, this is a histogram of the mean rates of action taken in response to different types of complaints. Um, there's a typo in the figure title, I'm sorry about that. But we see that the median rate of responsive, responsiveness to complaints about shortages it hovers around 25%, but it's closer to 80% for complaints about leaks. So in other words, even the wards that are relatively more responsive to complaints about shortages, they're not responding to these complaints at a very high rate in absolute terms. So I've just thrown a lot of tables and figures at you, so let me summarize and recap. Overall, I find that a cut in the water supply uh, system in Mumbai in 2017, it really increases complaint making about shortages, but only where past responsiveness to complaint making is already high. And so what this suggests to me is that over time, responsiveness can shape citizens' use of this institution, even in the context of a clear service problem. And these findings suggest a divergence in responsiveness to complaints of different types can actually affect the use of these institutions for complaint making in the future. Um, and that patterns of responsiveness to one type of complaint can actually affect complaint making about another. So just to recap, what I've done with this paper is developed a theory to explain a fairly, what I think is a fairly underexplored topic, which is just how responsiveness to complaints in um, these e-governance e systems, but also bureaucratic formal institutions more broadly, varies with just what these complaints are actually about, um, what their content is. And so I can create a distinction between allocating and non-reallocating complaints. And this distinction is made based on the incentives and constraints of the bureaucrats who are handling the complaints. And so I think this paper makes a contribution to sort of an emerging literature on bureaucratic constraints. It also highlights the potential for future research on how bureaucratic constraints can affect service delivery because we normally think of service delivery as, you know, being purely political, but I'm arguing that the constraints of people handling these complaints matters quite a bit as well. Um, and this is also, to my knowledge, one of the first studies out there that includes data on both complaint making and responses. So it's really able to show us how the behavior of citizens and officials sort of shape each other over time. Um, from a policies perspective, I think this paper really shows us the limitations of formal complaint making institutions and these sort of e-governance platforms um, to improve the equity of service delivery. Um, the most important point is that places with different levels of service delivery are going to make different types of complaints. And this might be obvious, but when you factor in the idea that these different types of complaints are more or less likely to get a response, then you realize that these institutions can really generate diverging equilibria of complaint making and responsiveness in different areas. So a question that emerges is, 
what exactly is the point of these institutions? The main motivation for setting them up was to increase transparency and equity in service delivery to really sidestep entrenched patterns of making complaints through informal networks. But the study, it shows me at least that it's probably unavoidable for citizens to work with politicians or individuals who really um, have the power and incentive to reallocate resources for certain types of complaints. And you know, this makes sense because redistribution, it's a fundamentally political process and we want our elected officials responsible for this, right? Not our unelected bureaucrats. So one thing that these systems can do, however, is crowdsource important information for government officials. So the co complaints about leaks, for example, example, they point to clear problems um, in service delivery that bureaucrats might take a long time to discover on their own. And we know in the context of Mumbai that um, the BMC spends a lot of money trying to find these leaks every single year. And so this um, grievance redressal system actually provides information about where the leaks are. Um, so more broadly, um, institute, these institutions, they can generate information about where the inequities in service delivery actually are. And so if you remember one of these first figures that I showed you of the neighborhoods in Bangalore, um, politicians didn't actually know where the places with where the places with infrequent water were. Um, so the information can generate equity and service delivery if it actually reaches the right people. So in short, I think the study tells us that these institutions can get certain things done, they can address certain types of complaints, but they're really no substitute for accountable politicians. And yes, that's all I have for you. Um, I'm really looking forward to hearing all of your questions and reactions. Thank you. Thank you, Danu. I think we already have uh, one hand up. I, I also have a couple of questions, but Patho, uh, your hand has already been up. So why don't you go first? Do you want to stop uh, sharing so that we can see you? And yeah, I'll also try and see. Patu, do you want to ask? Sure. Uh, no, uh, thanks, Dr. Just a quick um, uh, thanks. I know this is um, careful. Uh, so, uh, if I understand what you're saying, you're saying that uh, if the bureaucrats do not respond, then the citizens will stop asking. Uh, and so now, um, over what uh, over what time frame uh, is this uh, database of yours? And do you have any instances where uh, sort of I mean, um, I mean, do, do you have an understanding of how the structure of the division is? Like, do bureaucrats shift? Around so that are there, is there different types of bureaucrats, some are responsive, some are not responsive. Is it possible for um, a particular division or a particular ward to which people are not responding suddenly to be replaced by a responsive bureaucrat and vice versa? Uh, is there anything of that that's possible within the structure? One is within the data, but you know, even outside the data, is it possible that it's something that's out there in terms of the uh, manner in which the department is configured? Is it, do people move around or are they, if somebody's posted to ward M, then that person stays in ward M for a very long time? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so yes, um, starting from the very beginning of your question, yes, so I'm, I am sort of saying that if bureaucrats don't respond, people stop complaining. It kind of makes sense, right? Why would anyone want to waste their time complaining if nothing will happen? Um, and so this data, it was collected over three years, uh, 2016, 2017, and 2018. Um, and I think of my measure of responsiveness as really over prior responsiveness as prior responsiveness over th six months. Um, but and I think that's sort of a good amount of time for citizens to sort of form expectations about whether they'll get a response or not. But that's a really good question about um, how the handlers change. 
over time. Um, as you suggest, uh, the person who's actually you know, deciding whether a complaint gets a response. This is an assistant engineer in the waterworks department. These people normally are attached to a certain ward. Um, so we'll have the ward M assistant engineer, the ward, um, you know, the ward P assistant and P North assistant engineer. So they are fixed. But of course, they'll change over time, and that's a really good idea for something to look at for future resource, uh, future research, right? Whether um, turnover in um, the hand, in turnover in the handlers affects um, responsiveness, which might in turn um, affect complaint making. I think that's a great idea for future research. My impression is that the, the turnover isn't very high because these assistant engineers are um, they're people with specialized knowledge about the water system and so we we will get some turnover but it won't be that frequent so it might be you know a couple of wards have reappointments in a year or something it's not something super frequent but it's definitely something to look at thank you for the idea and the question Partha, do you have a follow-up or um, I can go no, now? Uh, I'll, I'll come back later. All right, all right. Folks, please put your hands up or, I mean, raise your hand or type your question or, or, or just type in the chat saying that you want to ask a question. So various ways of reaching out, but I'll, I'll sort of, uh, Aprajita, I'll ask my question and then, then move to you. Uh, so I had two different sort of minor questions, really fascinating uh, presentation. And I was thinking of two, 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 I had two broad questions as you were talking and you answered some of it, but I'm still perhaps, I mean, perhaps there's much more work to be done in the area. One was of course, what are the incentives for bureaucrats and politicians to ensure that these formal redressal systems work. So, you know, the, the formal redressal system is, is, is bureaucratically addressed and we have making, make, we're making a distinction between that and the system that works through politicians or handlers or political routes. So, but then is there a political accountability of the formal system at all, or does that not even feature because that then tells us something about the place of that formal system within the larger uh, way a city is governed. So that's sort of one, one set of things. Um, and, uh, and, and, and that leads me to a larger question of what's the goal of, of the system? Is the goal to reduce complaints or is the goal to generate data by actually having many complaints and then showing a high rate of complaint redressal and so so the essential question is how is how is the success of the system actually measured do you have did you get any sense of that from 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 your research and uh, you know it, it might help us understand how this system sort of is placed inside the larger larger urban governance or responsiveness thing i had a second sort of side question which was about this question of service, you know, this different areas with different service quality levels. Um, you say that the demand levels don't change that much. Is is that has that something to do with people's ability to access these online kind of complaint mechanisms? Because I mean, as a citizen, I do see that. You know, uh, I live in in Gurgaon, and I, I, we have a similar thing for waste. Uh, you know, and you can take a picture, and it gets geotagged, and so so the the municipality does use it for specializing some of these kuda kahan jal raha hai, and you know mm -hmm. they ask you to send a picture, and so they can sort of figure out where it is and stuff like that. But but the complaints keep coming from the same locations over and over. And I, I haven't done any in depth research, but I'm wondering whether it's something to do with the ability of, of certain kinds of citizens to quickly access uh, these websites and apps and, and things like that. Yeah, it's a really good question. I'll, I'll answer the second one first and then because the bigger ones of <laughs> more of an I don't know kind of question. But yeah, so what I find is that across boards, we actually don't see a, I don't see that, um, across the different types of complaint types that we're seeing a very different pattern of complaint making, um, at least with respect, complaint making in general, at least with respect to um, where the main variable is prior levels of service delivery. So what I'm seeing is generally 
all areas are making complaints they're just making complaints about different things um and you know this might just be because maybe there's just a decent number of rich people with smartphones in every ward there's just enough of all those people in all of the words i look at but you you could definitely imagine that this system is more or less accessible to different types of people um i do i do think that um the platform has done a good job trying to capture trying to sort of provide access to people of all different types of backgrounds because you can actually call in and make a complaint with just a regular phone. Um, it doesn't have to be online or through the app or something. So it's a little bit more accessible than the typical platform, but so I'm not really seeing a huge divergence there. It's just more in the complaint type. But I mean, I think that might look different in a different context, maybe, right? Maybe not in a place like Mumbai. Um, and then, yeah, so then the question is, what is the incentive for people to respond um, and where does this fit in in sort of the overall governance structure and how does Mumbai define success? These are really big open-ended questions. Um, I don't, I'm not quite sure what the answer to all of them is, but I mean, so a bureaucrat's incentive to respond would, would be, you know, I need to show certain numbers right um, at the end of the year the mc the bmc sort of takes stock and they look at responsiveness across wards and they they're not looking at responsiveness the same way i am they're just looking at the percentage of complaints that's marked as closed and processed right and so as a bureaucrat i want to get my numbers up i want to show that i'm doing a good job um but it's a little as a politician, I also want to be able to show that I'm doing this to, you know, show that my ward is well governed. But in Mumbai, this is actually a little bit tricky because um, a politician isn't elected at the administrative ward level, right? Within each administrative ward, we have a several electoral wards. And so accountability is a little bit hard to um, place. And I, this is a problem across India in general, right? Administrative administration and political boundaries don't line up all exactly. So it's a, the accountability question is tough. Um, but how do we, like, how do we measure success? What are these actually trying to do? And, you know, I think every year um, the BMC will release a, some story saying, oh, look, like in this past year, we, we closed 97% of complaints, right? So whether or not those responses are actually meaningful, um, it's, I think, so I think it's sort of an attempt maybe to, show that they're responsive to citizens. I think it's an attempt to make it easier for citizens to make complaints. But I think also sort of, as I hinted at the end of the presentation, I think that the real success of these institutions is to crowdsource information that's hard to find. I think that's secretly what they're doing. Um, yeah. Okay, that's insidious, but okay, <laughs> we'll take that. You can, uh, I mean, you can disagree. <laughs> No, no, I don't. I don't disagree at all. I mean, I think a lot of the stuff that the government is doing is motivated by this, by the need to collect or the desire to collect more and more information. And one is often asking the question of what are they doing with so much information, you know, uh, and that's the smart city sort of question that there's all this information, you know, every traffic light cameras, CCTV cameras, et cetera. And, and that goes into a different different direction with, with the surveillance and the privacy questions. But uh, I'll hand over to Aprajita. Our audience is very silent today. So folks, any questions? A lot, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people here are working on large city questions on Mumbai perhaps. So uh, feel free to jump in, Aprajita. Yeah, um, thanks. Um, uh, so I have a, I have two questions, small ones really, about um, how are you taking this um, uh, study forward? Like you're, um, I mean, at what stage are you at? Is this, um, the, the, how are you theoretically framing this question or, or this observation about like, if, you, if you're getting more responses then there are uh, more complaints from uh, this, this uh, state citizen relationship, I think uh, has a history to it. Uh, in terms of uh, the history of citizen governance itself. And um, in Delhi, of course, we've seen 
uh, experiments with bhagidari system and all that and uh, that was literally about inculcating a culture of complaining and that has sort of taken over everything else now but um, um, so if are you locating it within citizenship practices are you locating it within some uh, a sort of an economy of related to the second question about uh, how um, whether you are actually sitting at a very interesting cross point of sociology and economics in that sense it's like market governance but also at the level of people because we are talking about corporate governance now we are talking about states which are corporatized so might as well like start studying it studying them like as if they are uh, mini corporates but do you want to do that are you uh, I, i'm just thinking i'm curious about where you're placing it essentially yeah thank you I, i mean first of all after i'm done talking i'd want to hear about where you think you would place this and what you think the next things to study are but um i mean so i would agree with you where i think we do know quite a bit about citizen citizenship practice at this point right we know quite a bit about what makes people complain. And also like we know that there is quite a lot to complain about, right? Within cities in um, Mumbai, cities in India. And so what I'm interested in taking, doing, taking this forward is to really understand more about um, sort of like this question that I was talking to about with uh, previously, like what the constraints are and incentives are for bureaucrats and politicians. And I want to assume that um, a lot of these people are good faith actors, especially the bureaucrats. And I want to understand what kind of information would they need to be responsive, right? Um, what types of, and what kinds of processes would they need in place to be responsive? And so this is a question that extends um, in, two, in two directions, right? So what kind of information would they need from citizens, but also what types of processes do they need in place to be responsive, I think. And so, I mean, so I think what I'd like to do next is we know about citizenship practice, what makes it possible for the government to be responsive to citizenship practice, if that means, if that makes sense. Thanks, Tanu. So I know that Pushpa wants to come in. Pushpa, hang on. I'm just going to get you into the discussion. So Pushpa is a visiting senior fellow, Pushpa Pathak with CPR, uh, and uh, is uh, going to... Pushpa, you can ask directly. You can unmute yourself and, and ask the question. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank you, Tanu. I, I, clearly, this is an area uh, from your talk and from the previous dis discussion. It looks like it requires a lot more work uh, to understand. And uh, it is something that uh, we look forward to uh, what you will do in future. But uh, going by your presentation, I have two questions and one is very similar to what Aparajita had asked. I'm not sure what, what, what is your theoretical framework. Saying that you have tried to look at allocating, non-reallocating and reallocating demand, the nature of its allocatingness determines response. Is that an adequate theoretical framework or you want to make it a little broader in your future work? Uh, that's, that's one question. The second question is previous responsiveness. How did you assess, it's more uh, on method. How did you assess previous responsiveness? What kind of data did you use? Um, this was not clear in your methodology. So it assumes 
that repeated complaints were made by the same person or from people from the same area. So previous responsiveness, how did you assess? Is the second question, thank you. Yeah, thank you for those questions. So my theoretical framework is, the broadest theoretical framework is, I'm trying to understand, this is framed around the constraints of the bureaucrats and um, their incentives. And so my assumption is that they're trying to um, get through as many complaints as possible, but they're constrained by, um, by the time that they have and they're, and so, if I um, respond to certain types of complaints, then this might, if I respond to what I call reallocating complaints, then this actually might constrain my time even more by generating backlash from citizens in the form of more complaints or, you know, them complaining to my superior about me. And so I think the broadest framework is, yeah, the handler's constraints. And I think when we think about those constraints, then this divergence between the reallocating and non-reallocating complaints emerges. Um, but I mean, I'd be interested in hearing if you think that there are other sort of um, constraints that these bureaucrats face um, aside from th these main two types. And as to how I measure prior responsiveness, so what I'm doing is, um, so I have data from three years and these cuts occur in the supply cut occurs in March 2017. And so what I measure, so I have all of the complaint data and responsiveness data from, you know, about a year and a half prior. And so I'm measuring prior responsiveness as responsiveness six months before across the average responsiveness at about six months before the supply cut and any ward that's higher than the median level resp of responsiveness across this over this time is classified as highly responsive and any ward that's below this median is classified as not responsive if that makes sense mm -hmm. okay okay for now let other others ask questions thank you pushpa i'm not sure there are other questions uh, Partho, did you have a follow up? Probably not. So <laughs> it's late. Oh, no, so. Uh, hi. No, um, I was just wondering uh, what happens, Tanu, when so what kind of when there is no response, right? So let's say I'm not Uh, getting a particular kind of service, I complain, but there is no response. Usually, the there would be workarounds. You would catch hold of the local lineman, which is you know the kind of stuff that let's say, uh, and um, like we start the open stuff and get them to fix something. Uh, you might even have. Uh, informal guys who know, because one of her findings is that uh, the official lineman doesn't really know where the network is. There are these sort of guys with information who sort of know where exactly the structure is. So, uh, and again, it's also the fact that uh, in informal areas are more likely to have these workarounds, whereas Formal areas are less likely to have those kinds of workaround arrangements in the sense that if I'm living in an apartment complex, then having somebody come in and do this uh, uh, sort of, you know, you know, the lines, the structures, all of that stuff is much more uh, defined. So, in some sense, is it the case that a, I wasn't clear from your answer as to whether you do not find any spatial variation in the complaints uh, generation to begin with. But obviously, at some point in time, since you're saying that there is differential responses and then differential uh, sort of complaint generation, you would 
x post finds some kind of variation across this. So do you have a sense of the areas which from which are not responsive and how exactly uh, do sort of alternative arrangements for resolution of problems affect the both the generation and the responsiveness in some sense? Yes, yes. Um, so <laughs> let me clarify for so first what I, I guess what I was trying to say earlier is that I don't find any variation in complaint making with respect to levels of service delivery as measured by um, um, hours of water supply. But I do see variation, it's not in the paper, but with respect to things like socioeconomic status or literacy in general, um, places that are more literate make more of these complaints, um, places with higher socioeconomic status make more of these complaints and that's what we'd expect. Um, and I should have clarified that. But as to workarounds, um, yes, absolutely. If I don't get a response from one of these systems, then I'm going to probably use all of my other workarounds that I would be using anyways, right? And so that sort of, that goes back to the point maybe of these initiatives, right? If the point of this initiative is to expand access to the state, if the point is to sort of break, um, not break, but to make access to the state more equitable than if a lack of responsiveness might undermine this. And so, I mean, you mentioned that informal areas might have um, more ways to more workarounds. Maybe, I'm not quite sure I agree with that. It's, they might need to use them more, but also even if we think about informal areas in general, we would imagine that some areas have more political connections and other areas have fewer political connections, right? Even within an informal area. And so if, um, if, if we're seeing people resort, you know, lose interest in these complaint making in these complaint making portals and resort to their workarounds, this will just benefit areas that are more politically connected over ones that aren't, right? And so this sort of goes back to the question of equity and what the point of these initial these institutions was initially. Does that make sense? Or what would you what do you think? Why I would have thought that if you're using the political connection story uh, in the sort of archetypy sense, then you would there are politically connected areas and then there are areas that are connected in terms of uh, access to former bureaucracies and the response to complaints, uh, if it's higher in areas which connections to former bureaucracies, it's not necessarily, it's quite possible that the political, politically connected areas do not have complaint resolution that happens through the formal bureaucracy. So it isn't as if, yes, I might be politically connected and I might get my problem solved, but it need not show up through the formal channel system. So it isn't as if that the, my ward officer or my MLA, whoever it is, calls up the department and the department then does the work. Or even if it does the work, it's not recorded in the system that you sort of uh, scrape and put together uh, because uh, that would require somebody to actually file a so, right. uh, so if if it's happening because my ward councilor called up the assistant engineer and said, you know, go fix the problem in this place, the assistant engineer goes and fixes the problem, there is really no record of the system for it. Also, it's not done. So, how does that stuff work? Yeah, I mean, so two responses, right? Um, I mean, I'm not quite sure that I believe the whole thing where we have like, there's this bifurcation where we have citizens that respond, like participate through their networks. And then we have this other set of citizens that are participating through the bureaucracy, right? I think there's some amount of overlap there. Um, and at least what I'm seeing in my data is that we are still getting complaints from informal areas, right? Um, and often because they have more to complain about in the first place. So, I mean, 
but then there are areas without political connections at all. And we're also, I mean, so could you rephrase your question? I'm like. No, so, so I mean, be useful to understand how you classify these areas in that sense. So for example, as I said, let's assume that there is a sort of politically connected uh, informal area, a politically unconnected informal area, and then there is just a formal area. The formal area picks up the phone and calls, and there is a sort of uh, building society pays a monthly a sort of uh, allowance to the assistant engineer. He gets like 2,000 rupees a month from the building societies, and therefore, when the building society calls, he responds. Uh, the informal uh, area without the political connection might sort of call in a complaint because they have no access to the uh, sort of uh, political system and uh, their complaint may or may not get responded and if they don't get responses they might stop making complaints but then the problem remains as to what happens to their service levels you know, because especially like water there's only so much that you can just do without uh, you know, unlike a manhole where you sort of essentially put some red flags around it and keep the manhole remains open and you keep walking around the place. Mm -hmm. uh, and the politically connected informal area may not generate a complaint at all, but essentially use their political network to get their problem solved. But that both the generation of the complaint and its resolution will not feature the database and therefore be outside the data that you've actually collected. Okay. So in a right. sense, it is, is a selection bias, the formal way of putting it would be that there's a selection bias in the data that you have, <laughs> which essentially selects for areas which do not have the political connections to get the stuff solved in form. I'm just hypothesizing. So right. in, uh, is there any way that you can rule this out or rule it in or have any sense on how that stuff works? I mean, I guess what you're describing is how I think of as the universe of complaint making, right? All of the different ways in which people can make complaints and what, you know, what patterns of responsiveness might look like across every possible way of making complaints. And I guess that's not exactly what I'm looking at in this paper. I'm looking specifically at the usefulness of these um, um, grievance redressal portals. Um, I completely agree with you that I'm missing a lot of the complaint making activity that people are doing. And I think this is, ki this is kind of the point, right? Um, if we, if these systems like are maybe not that useful or responsiveness, then we revert back to basically what we know from the literature are these multiple different sources, forms of complaint making. Um, and so I agree with you, I'm missing all of that, but I'm also try not trying to capture it. I'm just showing that these types of institutions, they're useful to certain types of areas. And there's sort of maybe a limit on the type of equity that they can generate. And that's important because part of their, um, part of the, sta the stated motivation for a lot of them is to generate this equity in complaint making and responsiveness. Okay. All right. So, so sure. thanks, Mato. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, th this is this is one of those areas where I think finding completely satisfactory. Uh, I mean, it's so many open-ended questions there, and also the question of scale and and what the data can capture and what scale at at scale at which negotiations or, you know, like if, if you take a particular area, it could be a mix of different kinds of spaces. So it's really hard. I mean, it would be really interesting to see what you're saying in the context of the socioeconomic data that, uh, that, that, that you were talking about that is not in this paper, but you have looked at and that that is another conversation perhaps, but uh, you want to respond to that? Yeah, no, no, and just to add one more thing, like what I'm, my unit of analysis is the ward over time, right? And so what I'm trying to do is like control for like all of this variation across wards. And I'm just looking at how responsiveness within a ward changes over time. Um, in response yeah, to different which factors, is what I right? meant that that actually can I mean it's, it's it can hide the kind of detail uh, local level detail that 
we may be sure. looking for uh, as, as answers to policy questions or governance questions on the ground. Right. ground. But uh, thank you so much uh, for, uh, for generating all of these interesting conversations and for, for helping us think about uh, you know, uh, a particular kind of mechanism that the state has has increasingly been emphasizing on, uh, but we often don't know really what they do, what, the, what these things do. So uh, really grateful that you took out two hours from very early morning <laughs> to speak to us. Thank you everyone who attended. The As usual, the recording of this will be on CPR's Facebook uh, live videos page, and we will also share it on our website shortly. And uh, we will keep you informed about the next talk, which is the end of April. Thank you, Tanu. Thank you for... Uh, your talk today. Yeah. Thank you for having me. And also thank you everyone for your questions and ideas. Bye everyone.